So I thought I'd address everybody on, uh, when I was asked to do this, I thought about it. And a lot of these, a lot of the subjects that have happened here are, uh, are done on topics or stories uh, that photographers are working on or, and I'm sure some of them are about career. But I, I thought I would talk about uh, myself as far as the things that have happened along the way with my career and where this idea of being a newspaper photographer has taken me and the changes that have happened and what I've gone through to, to, to get to this point. Um, in, in as much as we all know that the industry has gone through quite a bit of change, and I'm not suggesting my example is a perfect one, but I, I'm, I think it might be, you know, through the photographs I might be able to explain a little bit about how I've been able to work as long as I have, and I still think I've got a lot, lot ahead, so I'm, it's kind of, it's, I think it's kind of a, the subject matter I have it always isn't the brightest as far as a lot of it's serious subjects, but just as far as the work we do, uh, I think I've got a lot. I, I got a lot ahead of me in my career still, and that's that's exciting. So I'm gonna, I, and I'm kind of using this image as an example. I shot this, I think, in 1981, and so this goes back to pretty much the beginnings of where I I started. I'm I'm not going to spend too much time on the early work, um, but. Um, Actually, that was at a party I was at, but I thought I'd show it anyway. But I was actually doing some stories about people who, who were getting up at dawn or spending working late hours and things like that, and that's what that was about. Um, and along the way, um, this photograph, for instance, I was working actually, I worked in Poughkeepsie, New York, at the Poughkeepsie Journal for about nine years. And the work there was probably pretty, like, pretty much like my partner's Chad here was going to be speaking, a lot of his early work was doing a lot of what we called enterprising or found pictures. And one of my biggest tasks in the, at the Poughkeepsie Journal was just going out and just going in the community and seeing what you found. And I came across this photograph, I came across this scene, and it turns out that this guy had just hand washed all these ties, hung them all out to dry, and he was sending them to his daughter to make into a quilt. And that was, so these are the kinds of images just things that, were in the, that we would find in the community that were just unusual sites. And, and this is the kind of photography we, was one of the things that we did. It was, we, we did a lot of news, um, and we did a lot of current events, but we also had this, uh, we had this, one of the things we did during the day often was just drive around and look for things going on in the community. And so I'm kind of, I'm kind of blending into the news here, but, and this was, uh, this is an example of sort of the, issues reporting we would do. This is now moving on to Cincinnati, near Cincinnati, Ohio. And this was from a story uh, about uh, a town that actually was being purchased by a company called American Electric Power. And it was so polluted that they went to everybody in the town and said, we're just going to buy your town and tear it down. So we spent some time in the town uh, just documenting what life was like there, living amongst all of these and while I was in Cincinnati, we, I actually started doing some international work. Um, so the newspapers, when I first started, and even, even actually when I was in Poughkeepsie, we actually did travel outside the United States at times. This little group of images is from um, India, but right after the tsunami in 2005. Um, and some of these people were affected by it. Other people were greeting people that were affected by it in some of these images. Some people had come to visit this orphanage. Uh, but I'm... So what I'm kind of trying to, and it's going kind of quickly, but I'm trying to take you into this idea that I started at this newspaper. It was a small paper upstate New York. But even there, we started working on broader subject matter than just the local paper, and just the local paper. Um, and of course, probably a lot of you are familiar with this scene from, this is the several days after the miracle on the Hudson uh, landed in the river. And this was, the, this was when they got a hold of the airplane and they, and they pulled it up basically with a, they said it weighed about a million pounds at this point. So it was the recovery of the aircraft. So in this image, I'm kind of moving on now. I'd spent actually, actually almost 17 and a half years in Cincinnati. And then I moved to New York. And right after I came here, this incident happened. But while I was there, I'm going to move back a little bit. While I was in Cincinnati, I was actually also at one point for about four years, I didn't shoot. And I was the night picture editor, and then I became the assistant director of photography. 
and before I left, I was the acting chief photographer because they had changed the title somewhat. So the work that I've been able to do as a freelancer, which most of what you're going to see now is, is that, um, I don't think I could have accomplished as well without being the job, holding the jobs, holding the titles that I'd held. It really gave me a broader understanding of what people needed, what people were looking for, how to, how to really have a good communi communication level with editors. Um, and um, it just really, it, it really smoothed the, the road for me, especially after being in my career as long as I had, which at that point was about 28 years. Um, this, by the way, was, uh, if, if some of you may remember this, this, uh, this French official name, Dominic Strauss-Kahn, was arrested for uh, having this relationship with a maid, and then she, she went to the police and said it was a forced relationship. And he was here for several weeks on trial. This was when he showed up to trial that day. This was a group of, of uh, maids from one of the hotels. They actually formed like a, a ring of solidarity around the courthouse. And this was them watching him go into the courthouse. And if there's any questions on any of these, I'm, I'm sort of talking about the pictures, but I did want to talk about the industry and, and the job and sort of the road that I've come along on. So just feel free to say anything. Um, this was uh, an image, um, moving ahead a little bit later, this was an image from uh, when this young kid named Ramali Graham was, was killed inside of his home. Uh, he had been chased in by police and he was shot, and this was a press conference, and that was his father at the press conference. And I'm going to kind of go through these a little bit faster. Um, some recent events here, this was from the funeral for Officer Lou, who was killed along with his partner last December, Officer Ramos. And this was the funeral with, of, uh, of, of Lou and his family and police at that funeral. And so talking sort of on the same track, uh, now that I've been in New York and have been freelancing, I have pretty much have become, most of my work here is in New York, and I, I work a lot for the Associated Press. Um, I also work with Newsday quite a bit, and then there's a few other entities that I work for. Uh, but my main, my, main, um, my main work that I do is really here in New York, I'd say 90% of it. And I actually did quite a bit of coverage on Anthony Weiner during his, when he was running for mayor, which was, can't really say much more. <laughs> I, also, I also work at, I also uh, am fortunate in a way, in some ways it's, it's a little difficult to, to get say things that are spontaneous, but I also work at the United Nations quite a bit with the Associated Press. And um, uh, this moment was um, when uh, the new Iranian president arrived for the first time in New York under quite a bit of a cloud of controversy. There was some question whether he would ever meet with our president or our secretary of state. And the first person he met with was the president of France, who's on the left, uh, Hollande. Uh, and we were all whisked into this little room. There was myself, a photographer from one of the wire services, a videographer. This thing happened in five minutes, it was over. And it was one of those moments that kind of comes along, which is kind of unusual. And this was the same day John Kerry, Secretary of State Kerry, was at the UN, sort of gripping his hands as this was all taking place, you know, and not, not at the same moment. But it was, it was a big day for the international politics. And I'm going to go through a series of photos here, just are more found features here in, in, this, in New York. Uh, this is actually the, what's called the Eastside Access Project, which is the new tunnels underneath Grand Central that will connect the Long Island Railroad with, with Grand Central. It's about 80 feet, I believe, below the... Actually, this is a scene out of LaGuardia where they're starting to tear down the buildings. Uh, some of the older buildings are coming down. And I thought the, uh, the haphazard way that all these letters were thrown to the ground was sort of interesting with the snow. And if you, ever, if you didn't know it, you can actually go inside the clock at Grand Central and open the door on the 6 and look out. So, <laughs> yeah. This is actually the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, uh, being cleaned for the morning. Uh, one of the things 
working in New York, and I think Chad probably has uh, done it. Uh, we fashion becomes whether you're a fashion photographer or not, it becomes part of what you cover. Uh, and a lot of, especially when you're working at the wire services, it's it, and even the newspapers, uh, it's it's a big part. It has been a big part. I think it's falling off a little bit, but a lot of us end up at the fashion shows, which is kind of an insane event. But um, that's actually some of our colleagues covering. Uh, attached to their cell phones at the UN, covering events at the UN. It's Miley Cyrus at New Year's, New Year's Eve. I was really cold. I could have had that jacket. I could have used And this was the uh, women's national soccer team when they came to, uh, had their ticker tape parade, uh, what was it, just a few weeks ago, I guess, right? Um, about a month and a half ago. I don't cover a lot of sports, uh, but this was the New York Half Marathon last year, and it's uh, Mo, right? Uh, Mo, uh, Mo Farrow. Uh, when he came in, it, it, this is a this is one of the most you know, he, he's he's always winning, he's always in in the front, and he's a very you know reliable runner. And he collapsed at the end. It was really unusual, and it was pretty scary because this is a guy that is, I don't think anybody's ever seen this from him. Uh, he was up actually on his feet not too long after, but. But um, yeah, he was. It was a pretty scary moment. That's his wife, actually, uh, with with her uh, hand on his head at the finish line. And that's our lovely winner near Central Park West last year. And this was actually in the middle of August. It was the 70th anniversary of uh, VJ Day. And this is a, it's kind of an interesting moment because events like this are, they're, they're pretty well um, choreographed by the people that, that run them. Um, and sometimes when you're going to them, it's kind of like you have it in your head, wow, what am I going to get? It's gonna, but it turns out that this couple on the left, I talked to them, uh, the couple on the left, uh, she was born in America, he has roots in Japan. Uh, her her great -grandf her grandfather was a, a soldier in World War II, and his parents were part of a Japanese group that was actually interned in the United States, and now they're married. So it is as sort of you know this this event was going to be what it was. It was going to be staged, but then I found out their story, and it really made it a lot better. It made it a much more interesting day for this type of thing. And sometimes Chad and I cover the president when he arrives. <laughs> and sometimes I shoot with my iPhone. This was the, uh, this was the first day uh, that we were, maybe not the first day, but this was one of the first days when we were allowed to do a tour of One World Trade Center in, in the last 15 months, I think it was. Not by eight months. And uh, I was struck by this gentleman just standing there, sort of, uh, sort of waiting as we came as a, as a group of, of uh, press. And just the one beam of light coming in, I found rather poetic in its own way. Oops. And if you haven't done the uh, polar bear uh, 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 at Coney Island going into the water on January 1st, you really should do it. Because that's what happens when you go in. <laughs> Okay. Um, it, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go on to some other things, but I want to know if anybody had any questions. Uh, Anyone has questions? I got a microphone <laughs> up here. Okay. I I'll, go, I'll go back. It's more fun. Whoa, yeah. whoa. I have a few questions. Okay. So, um, over the years, does anything, I mean, I know as a photographer myself, you get yeah. to shoot all this wild art and this, these really cool events. Does anything yeah. stand out to you as, as sort of your favorite sort of um, singles type event to shoot? Or new, is, is, do you like shooting news more? Do you like shooting um, features more? What's your, what's your thing? Well, I actually, when I was in Cincinnati, and it's funny, I don't have a lot in here, but when I was in Cincinnati, I shot sports constantly. I mean, I probably covered... 350 baseball games covering the Cincinnati Reds. I covered uh, Division One basketball constantly, uh, and one of the reasons was because when you live there, 
when you live in that and work at that newspaper, you're, with, you're within nine, 90 miles of about 10 different high-level college programs, and so specifically basketball. And so we covered every one of them. It was a big interest to our readers. And so what I found was that depending on where you live and work, uh, the, that particular newspaper, one of the greatest interests in that paper was sports, and was, it was college sports, not necessarily pro sports. And so that was a big part of our world. And we actually traveled all the time as a staff. We were always on the road, uh, and invariably one of these teams would make it into the Final Four. So pretty much every year I was gone for the entire month of March from home. You know, uh, we'd come home on the weekends, leave for five days all around the country. And, um, and, but now, I'll just to further answer the question, my preference now is to work on, um, on news and events and political news. Um, and then I've been trying to work on some projects, uh, some longer term projects that are more, uh, they're national, international, of, of national, international interest, let's put it that way. And, and did, are you still covering a lot of sports these days? Very little. I know I, know yeah. I used to shoot a lot of sports yeah. myself. I kind of got over it. Yeah. Well, what it is is, honestly, there's, first of all, I'm, there's some guys in town that are just great sports shooters, and I, I, I don't even want to step into their shoes. I mean, especially uh, football, I'm just not great at. I'm okay at, I'm actually pretty good at basketball and baseball, but there's, there's guys here that are, they're regular, they're, they're reliable, they just really know the stadiums, and they go there, and they, it's a very natural fit. And I cover like two base, I cover a couple of baseball games a year, and it's, it's always a struggle, and it just, just makes me nervous for my client, because I want, I want to make sure they're happy, and it works out. But there are, there are times when I, it, let's put it this way, if you're doing this, and I think this, you have to be able to do it. You have to be able to step up, and if somebody asks you, you gotta be able to step up and do it. And, um, and you do. Um, you may not do the proficiency that the other guys might be, you know, you, you'll do it well enough that it, it works for, usually that's for the AP. And, uh, which, and the one thing about working with the AP is that generally uh, they're more interested in the out-of-town out team because the local guys have other people there. And um, although you still, obviously you don't not shoot, but that's the idea of the AP being at these games is that they're really, they're supplying St. Louis or Cincinnati or, or LA because they're not going to send their own people. So in a very basic sense. I, I, maybe that's too basic to say, but if that makes sense. In your career, you must have, shot, you must have taken thousands, of, uh, thousands and thousands of pictures, right? Approximately how many would you have taken, and is there any one or two or series that stand out as your best for you? Um, I'm not sighing because of your question. I'm sighing because I'm trying to think. It's it, it's a really well as far as the thousands of images. Um, you know, I would consider myself a uh, a light shooter. I tend to not shoot as much as other people, and that's not to say I don't hit the motor drive because I do. There are things I do, and I come back and I say, "Why did I shoot this much?" Because then there's an editing issue. But the one thing. The one thing I'll say about it is, and I'll get to the beginning of your question in a minute, but the one thing I'll say is, is maybe, and that's just a maybe, that uh, because, I was, because I was a film shooter, maybe there's this sort of thing in the back of my head um, that slows me down a little bit in, in that regard. I'm not really sure. Um, but I think, I'm not sure if the best pictures I've shot are always my favorite sometimes. Um, Sounds kind of crazy, but sometimes the events that I'm covering, um, just on a personal level, uh, I'm going to show some pictures. I've been actually covering the, and this has actually been mostly on, on my own, I've been covering events very, very, in a very limited fashion on, on the Turkish Syrian border in the last two years. And, uh, and it's been most, it's been virtually the whole refugee issue. And as a matter of fact, I'm leaving tonight to go to Europe for like eight days or six days. And I'm, Doing a lot of this, a lot of these trips, I'm sort of, I, I work a lot of jobs that I'm hired for. And this is kind of dovetailing sort of my earlier conversation about the career that I'm, the career path I'm taking. So now what I'm doing is I'm trying to at least carve out about a month a year that I can work on projects that are very speculative. Um, and I'm not sure there's going to be a return on, on what I shoot, but I, I'm going for it anyway. And I do have clients that are friendly enough that I, I, I could probably sell some work. The rest of the time, I'm pretty much a day-to-day -day assignment guy, but, but those, um, yeah. So let me go to, uh, sorry. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one of the things, um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, and I'm going to go ahead and, and oh, I hope, by the way, I hope that answered your question well, because I'm, I'm, uh, I, let's put it this way on the, on the idea of what I, I like. I, what I'm hoping to do with some of the images is uh, have some impact and, and make people think about, even if they can't necessarily do anything about the situation, at least have some thought of what it's, what's going on. For instance, this refugee issue is very difficult for Americans really to do anything except maybe some, you know, and I'm not an expert on this, but maybe make contributions to the, some of the UN funds and things like that. And I think that's going to evolve. But, you know, nevertheless, uh, I'm, I'm, I, that's one of the things I've been trying to work on. Now, the, the, the next group of images um, are from, oh, let me do it again. But the next group of images are from um, starting out in 2010 with the Haiti and the, the earthquake in Haiti through, and I'm kind of probably going to move through these. Uh, these are some of the bigger news events of, of the last five or six years through a series of images from uh, Superstorm Sandy, and then you're going to see a group of work that I did from the uh, from the from the Syrian border, including. Uh, uh, no, that would be it for now. I'm sorry. And let me go ahead and get those started. And so this group of images, pretty much, I think they're pretty self-explanatory of the of the. This was about five days after the initial uh, shock hit hit Port-au-Prince. This uh, next group is an image is from the health, the health situation was very difficult uh, as far as the clinics and people. There was a lot of people hurt. There was a lot of people hurt by falling debris and a lot of them were, a lot of them had leg injuries for the simple fact that they were running and they were getting caught in the, in the debris as they were running away and, or in the head for that matter. Um, but this was, these numbers were being given to people so that they could be in line for a doctor at this clinic that was set up. And frankly, it was, this was better, the previous three days that I hadn't been there, someone told me that this was a lot better than what was going on, you know, 72 hours earlier. How, how did you get the assignment to go down there? Was it? I, I actually went on my own on this. Um, Is that what you tend to do a lot? You just sort of see something that you feel you want to cover? Well, what I did on this case, what I did in this case, um, especially because it was more or less in this hemisphere, was I have clients in town here who I, I call as a matter of fact, I call not just clients in town. I actually, there actually is a, a good, that's a good question for this series because this next image um, and, the, and the, series, the image after it is of a doctor who was from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And ironically, I had gotten in touch with a photo editor I work with in Tulsa. They had told me about this group of people that was working in, in Port-au-Prince. And I walked into this camp and, and I see this man sitting there, and they gave me four names. It was four people. That was it. And I walk into this camp, and he stands up with a piece of gray tape, duct tape, he had his name on it. And I said, I don't remember what it is right now. And I said, are you so-and-so? And I said, are you from Tulsa? And it was the guy. And it was by sheer chance that I came across these people the second day I was there. And I contacted the editor I worked with, and, and I, I said, you're not going to believe this, but I ran into the group was called. Uh, it was a. It was a. It was a group called I H. It was called In His Image International, which is the image of Jesus. Was this group's work? It was their mission work. But they were all doctors from from Oklahoma, and I just I ran into them, and it was amazing. And the the point was is that I, I'm glad I reached out to that editor because what it did was, for them it was the world. It was everything they wanted. They, they were covering it. They were covering these people. They had no one there. They had no idea if they were going to see pictures or not. And ultimately, it, did, it was really important to them to have it. And I'm really glad it happened that way. This guy actually had been, he was one of the people who had been uh, trapped for a number of days. He was actually OK, but uh, he, he, had, he was just overwhelmed at this point, dehydrated. 
when, when you're going through and documenting these types of scenes and this kind of chaos, yeah. um, obviously people do notice that you're, they're taking your photo, yeah. you're taking their photos, but yeah. sometimes you don't. Are you more of a fly on the wall? I mean, what's, is it awkward sometimes? Do you feel strange doing? Um, I think in this case, like, uh, well, these, you know, this is probably the first photo I'm showing where people are engaging me, but I actually thought, I, I thought the, their, they were just exhausted in what they were doing. In this, in this scene, they were waiting by the water's edge for a ferry that was gonna be 12 hours away to, to pick them up. And, uh, and, I, and they glanced at me and I shot the photo and I, they were, I think in this case, there were so many people that were seemingly in a state of shock that were there. It, it was, to try to talk to somebody, they, just, they would just walk away from you as if they didn't care you were taking their photo, they just wanted to get out, get out of town, which is what a lot of people did in this case. Um, and this was that sort of exodus that I was talking about. Uh, people, that's the ferry boat in the background. And these fishermen were, for like 50 cents uh, US money, were putting people on these boats. And, and if you look, you can see that boat is already loaded up back there. And that was another 12 hours before that boat left to go to, a, to, the, east, to the western end of Haiti. And because of the uh, aftershocks, uh, everyone slept outdoors, virtually everybody. They were too afraid to sleep in their own houses because of that. They kept continually crumbling. Yeah. And this is a series, I'm gonna go through, <laughs> I think Chad's seen this. I'm gonna go through this. Uh, this is a series of images from uh, Superstorm Sandy, st sort of starting out. And I think, I think most people, when these hurricanes come, I think we all kind of think, yeah, it's gonna kind of come and hit New York and go away. And the forecasters, yeah, they might have it right, they might not. But I thought, I thought it was funny because this is the beginning of the storm and, and only, only you know, at Coney Island would sandbags be pink, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and they were sandbagging their store with pink sandbags, which I thought was just the greatest. But then it came, and, and it was real. And uh, so uh, this is actually over in New Jersey. This is a sort of a ferry, bo I'm sorry, it's, a, it's like a stern wheeler that is like a tourist attraction that was, and this was even before the storm hit. This was the waves in the Hudson, this is the Hudson River. The waves were getting so big in the Hudson, they were crushing anything in its path. And this is actually over Little Ferry, New Jersey, where the storm was so bad that it actually backed up the Hackensack River by, I don't know, five miles. And there's a, there was a levee, an earthen levee, and it gave way, and it flooded, this, it, it flooded this town from miles away. And this is in the Rockaways. And this is over in Hoboken. Uh, so I covered a lot of towns, as much as I could. I covered for about 20 days or so, some with the Associated Press, some with Newsday. And this was the dog rescue right after the little boy. Shaggy, his name is. No kidding. <laughs> and you remember the issues with uh, gasoline and the lines started forming, and this was in Queens. This was in Queens where people were told they could come, there was going to be a gas truck waiting for them. And it was wrong information. It went on on the radio, and it turned out it was. They did straighten it out later that day, but it was a. And down in the Rockaways, all the this was near election, uh, presidential election, and uh, a lot of the polling places had flooded out, so they set up some, some temporary ones. And of course, the power was out south of Thirty Third Street. And scenes like this played out, especially at night, when people were, volunteers were showing up in parks and setting up food and clothes, bringing clothing. And of course the homeowners were dealing with a pretty much a mess. And this is about three weeks after in the Rockaways, about, I believe. So I'm going to go through these, and then I'm going to pause, I think. Um, and this is the series I started, this is the series of images when I started working along uh, this border, uh, sort of starting to cover this refugee issue, which is far from done. Um, and sort of the flowers belie the border. That's basically that Syria on the other side. It's changed a lot now. They've built walls there now. This is 2012. 
And this was formerly a tobacco warehouse, which was now housing. This was somebody just crossing the border and uh, back about, got about 4,000 feet from the border and somebody shot, him, shot the windshield for... This, is one, this was a soldier who had been hiding for three weeks, got over the border into Turkey and got into a Turkish hospital. And so when the, when the refugees, in this case, they were staying in a camp, um, which was really getting to them after a while, there was a farm nearby, and there was an old, basically a manger, if you will. And they would just go there and kind of rest and picnic, and this was uh, their baby sleeping while they were picnicking in, in this stone shelter. And this was a school that had been built, or sort of being built, Now this is one of those moments where someone came up to me and it was kind of hard to resist because it was just such a peaceful gesture with this, this little ring of flowers that uh, she came to show me. I thought it was, I was impressed by it. <laughs> this is actually in 2013. This is about a year later in uh, uh, 20, 20, 2014. And this is a city called Gaziantep and then another town. This is a town called uh, Akachile, which is only about at the time, I didn't know it, but it was only about 20 miles from what's referred to as the de facto ISIS headquarters in, 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 in Syria. Guy showing me his war wound, Syrian guy in Turkey now. And the border situation is like that a lot, where you could, you know, throw stones across, pretty much, hit the buildings. So all right, I think I'm going to pause for a minute, if I and uh, see where we're. I just wanted to see our time. Um, well, <laughs> uh, we actually have a few questions okay. from the internet. Sure. Okay. Which one? Anything. Okay. Um, so from the internet, we have. Um, oh, sorry. Hang on. Let me do this real quick. Sure. Make it look better. Hang on. You can you can go ahead. I okay. Can. From the internet, uh, who who is your biggest inspiration? Are you inspired um, by anybody in particular? Or any type well, I of think work? I think early on, uh, I think um, Eugene Smith would have been my my big, you know, my early early in my career, um, and uh, there were a series of photographers that were were doing sort of street photography in the '60s and '70s, and maybe even '80s. Uh, Bruce Davidson, um, uh, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting I'm, I'm I'm at that level or anything. I'm just saying they're the they're the inspiration, but. Um, uh, you know, Bruce Davidson, uh, there was this guy, this guy named Burke Uzzle, do you, you familiar with that name? He yeah. used to do a lot of these am amazing, just go into a parking lot and there would be a 57 Chevy parked in a black asphalt parking lot with markings and just maybe a, a street lamp. And he would do amazing things just noticing these very bleak scenes and turning them into like a document of who we were and what we are. And, that, and I which is, I'm not very good at that, but I mean, I'm very, I think it's really amazing when someone can look at the world they live in that's their next door and actually kind of make it this thing that's, uh, you know, special. So I, 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 those are like three photographers off the top of my head. Um, um, oh, what's his name? Um, the guy that did the series, I'm sorry, he did the series, uh, he followed, he was on the train uh, when RFK was assassinated and rode the train. Um, Thank you, Fusco. I was going to say Phil, but it's Paul Fusco. Thank you. And so those, and then now, um, I've got friends now all around me that I'm inspired by, um, and uh, including you know Chad and we, we have really good relationships, and you know beyond just the photography, and I do I do want to mention a good friend of mine too. There's a guy named Kevin Miyazaki who I work with, and Kevin was uh, I was actually his boss for a little while, and then he he left uh, the Cincinnati Enquirer. He went into more magazine work, um, but but this is a guy who is his photography is just beautiful. It's so simple and it's just beautiful and 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 and, and I like it. And I, I'm saying that because I think that's the one thing about I, I, I wish I could do better is sort of simplicity and beauty and in, in telling a story that way. And uh, so those are some people. I hope. <laughs>
And then uh, one more question, more of a technical question from okay. the internet, is yeah. uh, asking about your lens usage when you're, you're covering this kind of documentary rep reportage yeah. style. Do you have a go-to kit? Well, it's changed a little bit. Um, um, I actually, you know, when I got back into freelancing, I mean, I went out and I bought, you know, pretty much two zoom lenses and two cameras. Um, and I have gotten on to shooting with more, uh, you know, prime lenses. Um, for a while, I was, for a long time, I was using a 24, 1.4 with a Canon 5D Mark III. Uh, and I was getting pretty close to my subjects most of the time and then, and then using a zoom lens on the other end, like a 70 to 200. So keeping the kit rather simple. Um, and at times it was a real problem because some of the assignments that we cover, you, you really, if you don't have zooms on both ends, you can really hurt yourself and kind of fail. But, but when I can do it, I try to keep the kit simple. And now I'm actually shooting, now I'm actually shooting, um, I'm still shooting with Canons, but I'm actually shooting with Sony's also, with the A7 series. And I, I don't want to go too far into that because I'm still working with them, I guess it's fair to say, but um, I, I really like them because in a weird way, as technologically advanced as they are, I think they almost take you back to a smaller camera with smaller lenses. You can actually mount uh, Leica lenses and other uh, uh, lenses, which I do, and, and it, 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 it almost pushes you back to a little bit more simplistic uh, camera. It's not a simple camera, but when you, you, if you set it up the way I've been using it, it's a fairly simple manual focus, manual exposure, full frame too, so. Oh, sorry. I have a question. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about the process of decision that you have to make when you encounter like really uh, tough situations. For example, I'm thinking in this child that appeared in the shore of Turkey. Yeah. And El Mundo, it's a Spanish newspaper. They decided to go with the cover with this picture and they showed like the process, the discussion of the team, whether to take the picture or not right. in that place and whether to publish or not. So what happened to you being in the place when you encounter that people or really graphic goons sometimes? Mm -hmm. What is your decision whether to take the picture or not? Yeah. And after that, as an editor, how do you decide if it's worth to show that, yeah. considering that it's like really impacting for the people that read the paper. And well, it's always like an ethical discussion for journalists and editors. So I wanted to know your opinion. Well, I think probably my, most of my colleagues would agree that you, you uh, and I don't mean this lightheartedly, you, you, don't ever, you, never, you, don't, you don't ever want to really hurt somebody, somebody whether it's physically or, or, or emotionally. And you don't want to be hurt yourself either mostly physically. So I think if you get to the point where, uh, if you get to the point where you're, you're, I mean, some people are just mad, you know, no matter what, and, but I think, and, and, and you know, not to, not to be too facetious about it, but I think that if, I think the idea is that most of us who do this job have a, have a, a decent idea of the sensitivity you need to do it at, at that moment. Um, and certainly there are times when people, are angry, uh, but in, in a situation like, for instance, the earthquake, there's there's so much there that if if someone really was really angry at me for taking, I, I mean, there's no sense in pushing it. There's just so much more there to do, and why would I want to stand my ground? And so that's, I'm not sure that's the best way to describe it, but I, I kind of look at it as I, I want to kind of uh, I, I want to go into it, making sure that it after it's done, and, and, and often we talk to people and get their names. Um, and if, you've come to, if you get to that point, you realize you successfully made this connection, that you, you've, you've softened the, the, uh, the, the initial contact, and uh, um, sometimes it doesn't work. It's, sometimes it never works. And then as, as far as um, a great example um, of an issue that it's actually came up this week, with uh, and some, I'm, I'm assuming some people saw that photograph that was taken on the beaches of Turkey, where this Syrian boy fell off a raft and drowned, um, and it was flying around the, the internet and, and social media. Um, it ran in, especially in Europe and other places in the world. But there was a lot of there were a lot of American newspapers and television stations that did not run that image. Um, and I think the issue there is um, their decision was probably based on not wanting to hear the phone ring or not wanting to have people having threatening calls and emails and 
and Yelp comments, uh, and 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 I'm not I'm not even suggesting I'm saying the editor was wrong. It was their decision to make. Uh, I don't think it would have been my decision. I think that that photograph, as cruel as it is, I think it is an issue that I think there are moments I think that happen where they transcend what you may might do normally, and I think that's one of them. Um, and I think it brings uh, focus and attention to something that uh, it's been going on for three years, if not longer. Um, and it, it's a, yeah, it's a, it, it, and it, not, not everybody's going to agree with that decision, I'm sure. Uh, and um, and I'm, I'm telling you one thing, too. I don't even have any problem. If, if I make a decision and, and if people ultimately convince me I'm wrong, I, I really don't have any problem apologizing. I really don't because sometimes we make decisions and just don't make the decision in a vacuum. You know, get a good, a good idea of what's out there and a good idea of who you work with and, and get a real informed decision on what to do. Uh, we have a few more questions from the internet. Okay. Um, one, was, one person was asking, uh, are you always shooting natural light or do you... Uh, use artificial from time to time. I, I virtually always shoot natural light, and I virtually always shoot in raw. Uh, if I can, there are some assignments where it just can't be done. Uh, for instance, um, when I worked with the, I, I didn't say I shoot sports. Now here I am talking about sports. Uh, I shot the NFL uh, draft with three other counterparts at the, eight, the Associated Press, and what was happening because it's the type of assignment it is. What people want to see is there's hundreds of football players. And they want to see their pictures, and they're moving very quickly on the internet. So they gave me a, a big Canon camera with a remote with a remote trigger with a remote uh, trans transmitter on it. And as I'm shooting the photos, there there's an editor sitting up in the in the seats at Rock at uh, sorry at uh, um, Radio City when it was still there, and she's taking in the images and she's editing them and they're sending them out very quickly. Um, so in that case, I was shooting JPEGs because it called for it. But most of the time when I'm doing these projects, I'm shooting raw. Um, I mean, I still take, I still take, take great pains in exposing the, the images where they should be. And um, I also, um, uh, what was I going to say about that? Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say as far as, yeah, just because I'm shooting raw, it does give you a lot of latitude. But I'm more interested in shooting raw because I know that if, if somebody's got a white hot shirt on that I am going to get that detail back, I can still make the proper exposure. It's not necessarily about um, just shooting everything with, with no thought at all in metering. Uh, and then the second question was about your career more. Uh, it, um, how long did, were you shooting, um, I guess, as an amateur before you, this became your job? You know, I think people probably want to follow in your footsteps yeah. and do this for a right. living. Uh, high school. Uh, and I thought I was actually going to be a trumpet player, but it didn't work out. Uh, so, uh, but, because uh, you should have heard it, it was bad. But anyway, uh, but I started shooting like for the yearbook. And interestingly enough, that what, what I really liked was I would go to the classrooms. I would go to the classroom. I would go to the window, because every a lot of school classrooms have a little skinny window. And I would go to the classroom and shoot through the window. And I would, what I noticed was I was catching people in their natural acting naturally. I wasn't interfering with them. They were doing, their, they weren't posing. And that's when I kind of, that was really very quickly, I was like, wow, this is great. Like, I'm taking these pictures of people actually doing what they do. They weren't always flattering, but they were, but they were doing what they were doing, and I thought it was great. And then, and then I, uh, I actually ended up, um, I went to college at, actually at the Fashion Institute here in the city. And they, at the time, the college was quite a bit different than it is now, and they actually sort of let me sort of tailor my, my, um, my schooling there. I, I was shooting things probably a little differently than some of my classmates applying different skills. And then ultimately, I started, I got a newspaper job in, in, at a 8,000 circulation newspaper in Sarah, Pennsylvania. Um, just, it's not that far from here. It's like four hours, three and a half hours up, up, up New York and just across the PA border. And I moved to a slightly bigger paper way out in western New York, in Hornell, New York. And then I moved to the Poughkeepsie Journal, and that all happened in about two years. And I was actually uh, in Poughkeepsie for about nine years. Uh, I just want to say one thing about Poughkeepsie, too. And um, I worked in Gannett, by the way, uh, for 25, and I left voluntarily. I was, I, we moved, my wife and I moved here for, for her new career opportunity. Um, but when I was at Poughkeepsie, as small as the paper was, it was a fantastic uh, 
it, it, the numbers, the circulation number, numbers belay what you might think of as a, a big newspaper approach. And we did, we did great stories, we did aggressive news coverage and really weighty topics. And our readers were really appreciative. Uh, it, was, it was exciting that it was, you know, it had been nice to reach more people, obviously, but very rarely was, you know, sometimes it was controversial subjects, very rarely was it an issue. Um, so it was, I got really lucky because that first nine years of my career was um, at a small paper gave me a, a, almost like a big league uh, approach. Um, I, I believe we have one more question, and, and that was, you, you were showing some pretty emotional work recently, and, and this person was wondering, so your emotional level when you're covering something yeah. like this, does it take a toll on you? Do you ever, they ask specifically if you ever cry after yeah. you see something, but I, I mean, in <laughs> yeah. general. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, um, you know, yeah, the, the issue with, uh, you know, uh, I, I think specifically I can t think of one, you know, one difficult assignment. There's been a lot of difficult assignments, but I think, I, I would say covering I covered the, uh, the Sandy Hook massacre for about 10 days. And that's a lot of time, that was a lot of time, you know, to be up there. It was, it was uh, not only that, but we weren't, and I don't blame anyone for this, we weren't exactly the most welcome people there. And that is one time when you really had to be careful about the subjects you were dealing with. And, and let me tell you, at the same time, I don't take that, I, I don't give anybody Everyone there had every right to be mad or sad or whatever they were to us. I didn't care because it, it wasn't my problem. It was their problem. It was their community. It was their families. And if somebody wanted to yell in my face, go ahead and yell in my face. That's fine. Uh, because what am I going to? I'm not going to stand there in a situation like that and, and suggest that me being there is more important than their grief. But being that said, it was uh, it, it's. And it still it still weighs on me today. That was that was probably the most difficult assignment, just in general. The subject matter obviously was very difficult, but just the time spent there. And um, it was uh, easy for me to say. I don't live there. I didn't. My kids, fam, you know, my family's friends didn't go there. So they they obviously they obviously shoulder the burden for that grief. But but as a journalist, it was it was indeed. I I would say. You know, not that covering the disaster in Haiti wasn't harsh, it certainly was, but there was a different kind of emotion there. It was something none of us had ever experienced and hope, we had hoped we'd never experience again. Hey, can, I, can I ask our business question? Sure. Uh, are you an independent contractor at this point, or do you... you yeah, we, we sign, like whoever we work for, we sign a contract. They're all different. They, everybody has their own contract. And the ownership of the, the, photo the, the photography that you have, is that yours or is that? It, de it depends on the client. I see. And so it's really up to me to accept if I don't own the images or not. Normally the way it works is there's an ownership after a certain period of time. Sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's a month. Uh, sometimes it's not at all. So we, you have to gauge, and there are some people that won't work for people who own their images outright, um, but that would probably be the, uh, that probably be, I mean, I, I, it's a little bit general, but I mean, I think it's descriptive of, of the contracts and how they vary. Uh, and there, there are other things and the, there are other, uh, the, there's, there's some other clauses that there's, you're sort of like an employee, but you're, you're not really, you're still independent, but there are some things, there, there's some things we have to uphold as if you were an employee. Yeah. Uh, you know, character, you know, things like that. <laughs> you don't want to embarrass the company. But, but outside of the contract, that's about it. It's mostly about the pictures. Yeah. And, and if you wanted to put your own personal display of your work somewhere, <clears throat> and are, do you have access to those photos? Yes. If you sold them, they're gone. No, no. Right. That's, that's just like everything I've got here. Well, not everything, but some of the things I have here is they're, they're technically I don't own them. But as far as your own self-promotion or as far as a display or a yeah. show, yeah. Okay. Not a problem. Thank you. Yeah. I think I'm... Uh, I think, I, I, yeah, I, I feel that, that right. I've accomplished what I need to there. All right, everybody. <laughs> Craig Ruddle, thank you so much. It was great. <laughs>